Oh, welcome to the news bar. Got a bit of a, maybe a meandering topic here, and uh, we did get a bit of a false start, so let's see. I'm not going to try to redo what I did. I'm just going to see where this goes. If it's like I, what I did before, great. Okay. King Charles. <clears throat> King Charles I of England. That is a picture of King Charles I, and I believe that's supposed to be Oliver Cromwell, although I picture maybe his nose would be a little bit more bulbousy. But in general, that looks like... <clears throat> I think that's supposed to be Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell is an interesting character, and he emerged in the whole course of the English Civil War, and he led the New Model Army, which, by the way, I love that phraseology. I love that New Model Army. I, love that. I mean, basically, it just means look, that we have a new model for an army. It's a New Model Army. That's all. But still, it's so very, it's so very. I mean, I would love to have been part of the New Model Army. Just uh, sans the killing and the getting killed. I'm not for... I'm not for uh, putting pointy things in flesh, <clears throat> especially when they're, well, humans, definitely. And I'm also not for putting, yeah, and, and even 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 blunt objects into, whatever. I'm just not for the mangling of, of life in general. But uh, be that as it may, Oliver came from a group called the Levelers, where he really got a lot of these, uh, a lot of his, uh, I guess, source of power. And these people were largely Puritans, Christian Puritans, so uh, they were, I guess you could say they were very, very Puritan. <laughs> they had a very, very, very strict interpretation of the moral right way that you should do things, and their interpretation of what the role of the state was in assuring that moral rightness was done was a... I'm going to say every bit as rigid as the <clears throat> thing that they were, maybe even more rigid than what they were replacing, which Charles I, I am not a scholar of history, uh, but I do have a fair degree of understanding of the English Civil War, fair degree. And my, my sense of Charles I is, is he was really, I mean, he had Catholic persuasions, let's just say. <laughs> um, and he was pushing back to some degree against efforts by the Protestants before him to kind of freeze out Catholics in any kind of position of, of authority. He was trying to undermine the power of of people that had the, the Catholic type of uh, religion whatsoever. What, what's so nuts? And so <clears throat> maybe he pushed back a little too hard and the Puritans used that as a, they a cry for justice as, as is often they 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 were crying out for justice for a leveling of the field for 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 people to be treated on the merits of their cases and not the nobility what what it really was was the nobility was fundamentally opposed to their version of 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 christian governance i guess you could say <clears throat> and i won't get into all that cuz that's a whole other story cuz it's not totally uh, important here uh but what it is important is that we have we have taken a position where in a land in which the divine right of kings was fundamental to the the very identity of the English nation Oliver Cromwell was able to get basically most of the support of England <clears throat> behind him beheading the English king so this is a significant temporary shift. <laughs> but it was a false shift all along because Cromwell quickly became the Lord Protector and he quickly be cook took on all the trappings of the king and he would die. <clears throat> he would die a Lord Protector still. I mean, I don't know if you could call it a successful realm at that point, but still... <clears throat> Not his authority wasn't fundamentally disputed, and the transferal of authority to his son wasn't fundamentally disputed. But it soon became apparent that his son lacked the. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say lacked the uh, whatever you need to basically be willing to smash people in the face to say no to you. That's what he lacked, and uh, so because of it, 
he was he was not killed by the way he was just uh, if I, unless I'm wrong, I don't believe he was I believe he was just sent off but they did they, they did denounce Cromwell and uh, they restored Charles II after well whatever <clears throat> so it was a pause in the divine right of kings of a, of a sort but still it's where our story begins where we're going to talk about how the king killer is the only king in this land, the United States of America, and how so long as that is true, we can avoid Oliver Cromwell and King Charles alike. And that king killer is the boar, which is the Bill of Rights. It's as simple as that. That's the short, that's the short end of this story. We're going to begin our story, though. We don't need to have this... <clears throat> We're going to bring in our story in Mesopotamia. And this is from... This is the University of Chicago. The first Mesopotamian ruler who declared himself divine was Naram-Sin of Akkad. Naram-Sin reigned sometime during the 23rd century BCE. But the exact dates and durations of his reign are still subject to research. According to his own inscription, the people of the city of Akkad wished him to be the god of their city. This first instance of self-deification also coincides with the first world empire of the rulers of Akkad, the first time that a dynasty established a territorial ruler over large parts of Mesopotamia. It was also accompanied by certain changes in religion in which the king proliferated the cult of the Ishtar, the goddess of war, and love. Naram Sin seems to have emphasized Ishtar in her warlike aspect and began to refer to himself as the husband warrior of Ishtar. Dang. I'm not going to lie to you, that's kind of hot. Interesting. Okay, it's all bullshit. <clears throat> Naram Sin wasn't. Okay, Naram Sin didn't identify with Ishtar. Naram Sin became Ishtar because Naram Sin was born in Ishtar. And Ishtar was uh, family, power, and prestige, and circumstance, and elevation, and legitimization. And uh, Ishtar produced certain types of foods which produced certain types of industries as opposed to other gods that produced certain types of foods which produced certain types of industries. Uh, maybe not so coincidentally favorable to the uh, particular <coughs> families of power that had uh, the vast, as is almost always the case, the vast monopolization of uh, market advantage. Uh, whatever institutions, industries, whatever uh, are born from these religions, these families will most assuredly uh, own and dominate, and it will not be in their interest for other religions to come along unless those religions can coexist with them and unless there is uh, I guess you could say if there is mobility of uh, vocation so if your religions produce similar types of vocational skill sets then you can more coexist but uh, when your religions produce like for instance if Ishtar had I'm not saying she did but if she did have uh, certain very real physical circumstances for which people would have to structure things and their buildings, their homes, whatever, it would produce certain types of uh, industries or that would specialize in developing forms that could be maximized in those circumstances. <coughs> That's what what happened. So here we have Naram Sin, who has uh, has taken the mm, the 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 extreme, I guess, of of claiming some sort of. Uh, deified justification of of authority over the vast majority of human beings you know the divine right of kings in in steroids is the divine right of the king and so you see this here happening with naram sin as the first historic example i'm willing to bet that there were there were other examples uh before that and we're going to go forward a little bit. We're going to go forward, and hopefully I'll be able to make this connection here in a, in a nice, disciplined way. Otherwise, I don't know. But I am going to take down this title now. I think we've had that title up long enough. What do you say? There you go. There you go, title. 
Confucianism. And this is from ancient.eu. Dang, ancient history encyclopedia. Confucianism is a philosophy developed in 6th century BCE China, which is considered by some a secular humanist belief system, by some a religion, and by others a social code. The broad range of subjects touched on by Confucianism lends itself to all three of these interpretations, depending on which aspects one focuses on. The philosophy is based on the belief that human beings are essentially good, that they engage in immoral behavior through lack of a strong moral standard, and that adheres to an ethical code and rituals which encourage it, enabled one to live a productive and tranquil life of peace which would translate to a strong ethical and prosperous state. It was founded by Confucius, a Chinese philosopher of the spring and autumn period. Confucius is considered among the greatest philosophers of the hundred schools of thought. Uh, also given as the contention of the hundred schools of thought, which references the time during the spring and autumn period and warring states period, circa 482 to 220 BCE, 221 BCE, when various philosophical schools contended with each other for adherence. <clears throat> he is, without a doubt, the most influential philosopher in Chinese history, China's history, whose views, precepts, and concepts have informed Chinese culture for over 2,000 years. Okay, so the Warring States period concluded with the victory of the state of Qin over the others and the establishment of the Qin dynasty which adopted the philosophy of legalism and banned all others. Confucian works were outlawed and burned along with those of any other non-legalist philosophers. Copies of the banned works only survived because they were hidden by intellectuals at great personal risk. The Han Dynasty, which succeeded the Qin, encouraged greater freedom of speech, established the four books and five classics as required, reading for administrative purpose propositions which led to a wider dissemination of Confucian thought which would seamlessly blend with Chinese culture after the Han declared it the state philosophy. Confucian thought would seamlessly blend with Chinese culture after the Han Okay. Now I thought they were going to say why, why is that the standalone quote? Okay. Well, I mean, <clears throat> whatever. So, here you have an interesting shift in the dynamic. Now, it doesn't really come out so much in here, uh, uh, and that is that uh, the underlying assumption, which we're going to get to, which, while while you he ends up banning uh, Confucian works, he basically only keeps the legalist interpretation of Confucianism, but the degree to which, I don't know where how much Confucian would approve of legalism or whatnot, but the underlying assumption of legalism, I think, and I'm not at all anywhere close to Confucian, and I'm actually just in the beginning of really trying to understand Confucian, or Eastern thought in general, in in a more systematized way other than the, grad, the, the occasional visits that I've made throughout my life. So uh, Confucianism, I think, does give the underpinning assumptions for what ultimately leads to legalism which is the school of chinese philosophy that attain well here i'm reading this from britannica and i'm using these sources just to make sure that some things i want to make sure are are, are not off of my memory because memory is is not as, not as not as accurate as i'd like it to be legalism school of chinese philosophy that attained prominence during the turbulent warring states era 475 to 220 bce and through the influence of the philosophers shang yang li si and han Feitzi, formed the ideological basis of china's first imperial dynasty the quin okay so that tells you a little bit about when it happened happened here you go the three main precepts of these legalist philosophies are are the strict application of widely publicized laws, the application of such management techniques as, a, as accountability and showing nothing, and the manip manipulation of political purpose purchase. The legalists believe that political institutions should be modeled in response to the realities of human behavior and that human beings are inherently selfish and short-sighted. Thus, social harmony cannot be assured through the recognition by the people of the virtue of the ruler, but only through strong state control and absolute obedience to authority. The legalists advocated 
government by a system of laws that rigidly prescribe punishment and rewards for specific behaviors. They stress the direction of all human activity toward the goal of increasing the power of the ruler and the state. The brutal implementation of this policy by the authoritarian Quinn dynasty led to that dynasty dynasty's overthrow and the discrediting of legalist philosophy in China for a time. Uh, so the legalist justification, if you will, of the right of kings, the right of emperors, is that the emperor is not is the holder of the moral code. The emperor, by virtue of being the emperor alone. So in in essence, in, in, in one sense it's it's might makes right underneath it, but it's more than that because it's not just might makes right. You have to have fruit after the right. And you have an obligation as an emperor to articulate all of your moral beliefs. You are now the morality. Legalism doesn't seek to objectively define the moral code. It seeks for the moral code of the emperor to be objectively defined. That's legalism. The def so the legitimization of the king or the in in the Chinese in this Chinese model, which is well before what we're talking about here in England, as they're just now dealing with the overthrowing the divine right of kings, some couple uh, thousand ish so years later, a couple yeah, maybe two thousand years later, the sixteen hundreds maybe, f yeah okay, roughly, uh, what the Chinese were coming to was a a legitimization of the divine of the uh, the the moral the moral fruit of kings it was the it's so it is it is the king who by being king asserts his first off his authority right there and then once he is king then the the morality must be defined by the king and that morality must be enforced objectively. The morality itself does not need to be objective. It doesn't need to be based upon the kings before. It doesn't, it doesn't have that type of precedent. It only has precedent so long as the king is, is, is the fruit of that morality. And uh, the fruit of the morality is the people, the land, and uh, the state, and the king. And it is uh, to set to have a vital king that can do kick butt stuff, to have a people who are experiencing a moderate level of prosperity. Prosperity is not the goal. Prosperity is not the goal. This is why Chairman Z talks about moderate uh, moderate prosperity himself now, uh, because he's gone back to this. He's he's re, re he's revising legalism and a lot of what Chairman Mao uh, did. Well, it was based, used a lot of these legalist constructs as well. Legalism and socialism are very, they're, they're a good marriage in, in a lot of ways. It's pretty natural why the Chinese had such a strong socialist uh, faction so quickly within it. But that, that's not the point of this story. So, so still, they went off the script and way earlier than, than anybody else. They were so far advanced in so many ways as far as statecraft and exploring the different methodologies and types of legitimizations of power that, uh, the way that I view it, the people would be willing to fall for. Uh, that That's how I view it. So, and that... And then a little bit of what I was talking about there is the mandate of heaven. This is a Chinese political and religious teaching that was used in ancient imperial China to justify the rule of the king or emperor of China. According to this belief, heaven embodies the natural order and the will of the just ruler of China, the son of heaven of the celestial empire. If a ruler was overthrown, this was interpreted as an indication that the ruler was unworthy and had lost the mandate. It was also a common belief that natural disasters such as famine and flood and uh, pandemics were divine retributions bearing signs of heaven's displeasure with the ruler, so there would often be revolts following major disasters, and the people saw these calamities as signs that the mandate of heaven had been withdrawn. The mandate of heaven does not require a legitimate ruler to be a... Well, anyway, it's a little bit... You don't need to... And then we're still here. The divine right of kings, or God's mandate, is a political and religious doctrine of political legitimacy in a monarchy. It stems from a specific 
metaphysical framework in which a king or queen is preordained to inherit the crown before their birth. Under this theory of political legitimacy, the subjects of the crown are considered to have actively rather than merely passively turned over their metaphysical selection of the king's soul, which will inhabit the body and rule them over to God. In this way, the divine right originates as a metaphysical act of humility or submission towards God. The divine right has been a key element for legitimizing many absolute monarchies. Uh, what the heck? Alfred. I want to touch on Alfred very briefly here. He's kind of relevant to this. Alfred, uh, I prefer Alfred also spelled Alfred. This is the way he would have spelled it. This is the way I spell it. Because I'm like that and it looks way cooler. Alfred the Great, born 1849, died 1899. This is from uh, Britannica.com. <sighs> King of Wessex, a Saxon kingdom in southwest England. He prevented England from falling to the Danes and promoted learning and literacy. Compilation of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle began during his reign, circa 890. When he was born, it must have seemed unlikely that Alfred would become king since he had four older brothers. He said that he never desired royal power. Perhaps a scholar's life would have contented him. His mother early aroused his interest in English poetry, and from his boyhood, boyhood, he also hankered after Latin learning, possibly stimulated by visits to Rome in 853 and 855. Boy, that's a man of privilege right there. It is possible also that he was aware of and admired the great Frankish king Charlemagne, who had at the beginning of the century revived learning in his realm. Alfred had no opportunity to acquire the education he sought, however, until much later in life. He probably received the education of military arts normal for a young man of rank. He first appeared on active service in 868 when he and his brother King Ethelred, Ethelred the I went to help Burgred of Mercia, the kingdom between the Thames and the Humber, against the great Danish army that had landed in East Anglia in 865 and taken possession of Northumbria in 867. The Danes refused to give battle and peace was made, and this year Alfred married Illsworth, descended through her mothers from Mercy and Kings late in 871. The Danes invaded Wessex and Alfred Red and Alfred fought several battles with him. Alfred Red died in 871, and Alfred succeeded him. After an unsuccessful battle at Wilton, he made peace. It was probably the quality of the West Saxon resistance that discouraged, discouraged Danish attacks for five years. Oh, gosh. Political ads. Come on. In 876, the Danes again advanced on Wessex. They retired in 877, having accomplished a little bit of surprise attack in January. 878 came near to, to success. And uh, they established themselves at Chippenholm, and the West Saxons submitted, except King Alfred. He harassed the Danes from a fort in the Somerset Marshes. This is a legendary period of time where he lived on, what, some sort of cakes. I forget which types of cakes they said he lived off of. Not like yummy cakes. I forget. Anyway, he harassed the Danes from a fort in the Somerset Marshes until seven weeks after Easter. He secretly assembled an army which defeated them at the Battle of Eddington. They surrendered, and their king, Guthrum, was baptized. Alfred. Notice that? Get baptized? Pagan. Pagan. Baptized. Christianity. Alfred standing as the sponsor. The following year, they settled in East Anglia. Wessex was never again in such danger. And then I'll tell you the rest of the story. <clears throat> the abbreviated version. I want you to get a sense of the desperation that Alfred found himself uh, born into. Like, he, he was born into a circumstance of stability, I guess, where... I mean, he can go. He, his family could afford to send their uh, their their vital youth overseas to tour in Rome. I mean, that's a that's an epic journey in and of itself. And then and then back. That's a significant period of time away from home. That's that's an asset that you don't readily send under times of stress. So he came from a, a circumstance of stability and quickly found himself in an unstable circumstance in which uh, the. Uh, center of power the vehicles of power that were confronting him were radically different in their uh in their religions not not necessarily in terms of the beliefs but in the types of uh institutions the type of vocations that these types of religions might uh produce uh the catholic uh or his his uh, you could you didn't really they didn't really uh, that's really wrong you, you, the 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 the, the self-proclaimed catholic and ecumenical church the world and universal church that's all that meant really but uh catholic as a denomination that doesn't come along till like the 1500s so he would have just considered himself part of the quote church he wouldn't have even 
uh, I mean, at that point, the Eastern Church hadn't even uh, separated from Western Church yet. So he would have just thought of himself as being part of the church, the Christian, as a Christian Christian church, the, the, like the, the ecumenical and Catholic church. And uh, that, would have, that was his vehicle of power. This were the vehicles of power of his families. And he confronted an enemy who uh, gave an alternative uh, to the rebels. Even, even if, if you lived in his lands and you felt like you were oppressed by his world, you probably would be inclined to think, well, oh, man, you would find a reason to become pagan. And your reason to become pagan is, is if you, the pagan system would fundamentally undermine the structures that the wealthy families uh, utilize to support themselves. But, but you wouldn't think about it in that way. It would have been some moral whatever. So now I know the truth. <laughs> I was lied to. Now I know the truth. And so what Alfred did is he went about the business of making sure that people were constructed of a certain place. And so he stamped Christianity, his particular version of Christianity, Christianity that, that continued to legitimize the divine right of kings, married Christianity and the state into one, made them inseparable. The state legitimized the, the faith. The faith legitimized the state. It was a self-referencing, what do you, what do you, what do you call that, uh, solipsism? Is that, is that, is that right? Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> might be using that wrong. I don't know. Uh, he went about the business of uh, educating everybody and and getting everybody. He went, wanted people to be able to read and he wanted to be able to be at a basic level. He had handed out these pens to people. You know, all these places, some of them survived. Beautiful, beautiful pens. It says I was I I am uh, I am I am my owner's pen. Are Alfred or I don't know something like that I wish I remembered the exact like maybe I should have brought that up but I don't think that's as important but uh, uh, he basically really is the father of the English identity even if he I mean he he would he's he's really he, he's the the Wessex uh, kingdom he's the one that held off and stopped the pagans from totally taking over England he was the last holdout, and then he ended up being the position from which uh, England emerged. So he is, by many English English kids, I'm sure, learn about Alfred. He is like George Washington, kind of in their world. So it's significant for me to bring him up, especially because America comes from that these English patterns, these English vehicles of power. Yeah. And then after Alfred, about 1,300, 500 years or so later, we get the Peasants' Revolt. The Peasants' Revolt is really fascinating to me. The pe well, I'll get to it. The Peasants' Revolt, also named Watt Tyler's Rebellion or the Great Rising, was a major uprising across large parts of England in 1381. The revolt had, uh, this is from Wikipedia, the revolt had various causes, including the socioeconomic and political tension generated by the Black Death pandemic in the 1340s, the high taxes resulting from the conflict with France during the Hundred Years' War, poll tax, and the instability within the local leadership of London. The final trigger for the revolt was the intervention of a royal office official, John Bampton, in Essex on 30 May 1381. His attempts to collect unpaid poll taxes in Brentwood ended in a violent confrontation which rapidly spread across the southeast of a country. A wide spectrum of rural society, including many local artisans and village officials, rose up in protest, burning out, burning court records, and opening the local ga jails. The rebels sought a reduction in taxation and ended the system of unfree labor known as serfdom and the removal of the king's senior officials and law courts inspired by the sermons of the radical cleric john ball and this is where we're going to pause and then we're going to come back to this all right john ball was the son of william and joan ball he's the first mentioned in the colchester court rolls uh, Ball was in prison in Maidstone, Kent at the time of the 1381 record. What is recorded of his, of his adult life comes from hostile sources. His utterance, and this is why we're here, his utterance. Here it is. Let's, let's read this. This is why we're here. This is what brings us here. This is what John Ball understood the Peasants' Revolt to be. 
When Adam eld and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? From the beginning all men by nature were created alike, and our bondage or servitude came in by the unjust oppression of naughty men. For if by God who would have had any bondman from the beginning, he would have appointed who should be bond and who free. And therefore I exhort you to consider that now the time has come, appointed to us by God, in which ye may, if ye will, cast off the yoke of bondage and recover liberty. When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? That is the key. That's all you really need. The rest of this is superfluous. Adam Eld and Deep Span, this is an appeal to the very Christian institutions that the state, the king, was using as a legitimization of the significant imbalance of power that was so easy to see because of the circumstance of the times. And the circumstances of the times were basically this. Everybody was dead. And because of that, the peasants, the people who had nothing, they were in a significant advantage over the people who had everything, but then found they had nothing because they needed all the peasants because they were fucking morons. And so the peasants, they got top dollar and they make you holla. And then what happens is peasants can build themselves in constructs where it are just as fancy and glorious as the royals. And that was a new thing. And suddenly peasants could look good, sound good, write good, print good as uh, the royals. They could uh, construct the world in a high level of crap that they must have assumed only special people could, could acquire. It's kind of like what you see today with why it is that so many techno tech techno tech companies are now pushing towards this whatever censorship there's a lot of reasons for it but one of the reasons one of the reasons why it makes it an easier decision for them is because if the tech companies are are basically able to cut off human beings from being able to freely produce high levels of craft uh, which they cannot do if they're so restricted in all the things that they say can say do and think while you let the 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 corporations produce media that that continues to to violate these very standards remember that that is the key the key here is what they're really trying to do is well i won't say this is again the 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 key key part but it is i believe as as important as any part which is cutting off human beings from being able to produce the same high level quality of craft in their basement using a camera that media people can have to do with millions of dollars of budgets and and glitz and glam and and it turns out especially when it turns out that more and more people like this stuff better than the corporate polished garbage even though the poor corporate polished garbage can can make edgy jokes for instance that uh uh, the rest of us can't youtubers for instance they can't even say the 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 coronaville word but cnn can on youtube any day any day that's that's kind of what's kind of undermining that and in here for john ball he's challenging and he's saying that the peasants revolt it's about the whole authority of the king itself he wants a why well, I would imagine would something that would be more like a direct democracy type of uh, system. That's what he wants. He wants to do away with the monarchy. Nothing short of doing away with the monarchy. And remember, he is the guy that, well, if you don't know, but if you do know, he is the guy that, fun, I mean, he is the poetic voice. And uh, Tyler Watt is the strength voice, and he is the poetic voice that gives the people their fundamental inspiration and, and belief that uh, they might actually be able to pull this off. And what they do is they end up marching into London and uh, stuff happens. St people are killed and, and it ends up uh, coming down to his. Smithfield. Everything comes down to Smithfield. 
so much of uh, why it is that we are here might have ultimately come down to Smithfield. On 15th June, Richard led, this is King Richard uh, the second, I believe, is it the second? Uh, the second, yeah. Age 14, right. He's a young boy. Richard left the city to meet Tyler and the rebels at Smithfield. Violence broke out, and Richard's party killed Tyler. As to how that happened, it's a dispute. Richard defused this tense situation long enough for London's mayor, William Walworth, to gather a militia from the city and disperse the rebel forces. Richard immediately began to reestablish order in London and rescinded his previous grants to the rebels. The revolt also spread in East Anglia. Now, they went through, by the way, systematically over the course of the next five to ten years, thereabouts, and tracked down all the leaders, including, I mean, immediately Watt Tyler was killed, and so was John Ball. He, they were both uh, executed uh, pretty quickly. Uh, well, Watt Tyler killed right here, and then John Ball shortly after. They're missing out some parts here. So what happens here in the Smithfield is... King Richard meets, and he meets the, after this has occurred, after Watt Tyler has been killed, and across the field in Smithfield, Richard is totally outgunned and outmanned. I want you to understand the circumstance. We are dealing with folks that have been, over the course of the last, I don't know, 40 whatever years, They've also been uh, conveniently being trained as uh, expert longbowmen in 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 the interest of serving in the the, the Hundred Years War. So, so there's that factor going on as well. This is 1381. So, because of that, you got people that are quite capable, quite competent human beings, quite self-reliant. They are people that are really the ones that grow your food, that build, that uh, know how to do stuff. And there's more of them than there are of you. And that's still the case even in 13... I mean, that's always better been, I mean, significantly more of them than there are of you. And King Richard rides out by himself. 14-year-old king. And I think him being 14 years old was really in his favor, big time. 14-year-old king rides out to these people after they just learned that their beloved leader, Watt Tyler, had been killed. And he rides up to them and he says, Am I not? And it might be paraphrased, but in essence, Am I not God's divine chosen king? Am I not your king? And then he says, Listen, we're going to meet your demands, assign your little thing, and then you guys can go home. They yielded because in the end, for them, they had not overcome this powerful vehicle of, of power connected. Most likely, maybe they couldn't ultimately separate because to them, separating from the state meant separating from the church and they weren't able to do it. And so they stayed and then they left and then men, most of the people that were on that field would have, uh, if they weren't killed, they would have experienced ostracism and just, it would have been done. So I get to this. This is uh, going to be relevant. You'll see. Well, hopefully. This is from Time. This is written, I think, in like 2016. Nope, 20, updated 2018. But I believe... Oh, originally published November 20th, 2018. This is this is the histrionics about... Oh, w by the way, if anybody uh, doubts that Donald Trump is, is, is not an authoritarian at this point... I mean, he's authoritarian. If he's not a, a fascist, if he's not trying to become king or Mussolini or whatever you think he's trying to become... He had all kinds... He has all kinds of opportunity to declare all kinds of emergency, whatever he wants, if he so desires during COVID, during coronavirus, and he hasn't, he hasn't. If anything, he's, people complain because he hasn't taken on it, using federal power enough. <laughs> Why America's founders tried to recruit a foreign prince to be their king and how that moment holds a warning for today. Not the way you think, son. 
Who is this that wrote this? Where is the writing? The author, Richard Hurwitz. I'm sure you're 100 years old. How old are you? Let's see who Richard Hurwitz is. Hurwitz. Okay. No face. All right, that's no problem. Authoritarianism is on the rise throughout the world from Russia to Turkey to Hungary. Ah, oh, whatever. Okay, I'm just going to skip through all that. Pissed. The years immediately following the victory of the British at Yorktown bordered on anarchy. Oh, gosh, in the words of George Washington, that is just not true. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what it was, and I'll just give you this real quick. So, so what happens is shortly after the Revolutionary War is over, what happens is all these state legislatures, they start to pass all these uh, tax laws that, uh, in some instances, increase taxes. People end up paying more taxes under American rule than under British rule shortly after the war. Not only that, but the, the tax laws are retroactive, and the whole reason for most of these, well, not the whole reason, but a significant a majority reason is is so that uh, families, large families, well, families with large uh, estates could seize small estates and grow their empires. And they were competing with other families, so they had to build as fast as they can. So they were doing stuff that were picking people off. And then the people would show up at the state legislatures because you've already established, you've even, the leaders themselves said, listen, man. When they act like tyrants, and this was like, dude, this is fundamental. You lied to us. Like, we literally fought to not have this. And then you have these uh, uh, so-called uh, whiskey rebellions, and and George Washington leads the charge against the uh, the, the, the Pennsylvania whiskey rebellion. And uh, not so coincidental, George Washington, by the way, his whiskey company, exempt from the whiskey tax, exempt exempt and he was the one that marked all the way across pennsylvania to pittsburgh uh, somewhere around that area and uh captured a bunch of uh of whiskey rebellioners uh, put down the rebellion without having to fight it was already pretty much shot by the time he arrived and he was just there to collect the people and he marched them to philadelphia and and a few people died in that march that's george washington your hero don't get me wrong. I love America. I love the Bill of Rights, and I'm an American citizen. So when I say all these things, I don't want y'all thinking that like I'm, I'm an alien in the land because I am not an alien in this land. This is my land, and I'm throwing in with it. But that doesn't mean I approve of all the crap that it does. And I definitely don't approve of the lionization of George Washington. But uh, there's their version of it but uh so so that's part i i literally wasn't aware of uh, until recently so and so it was that in 18, 1786 the president of the continental this part right here not the part that i shared with earlier and so it was in 18, 1786 the president of the continental congress nathan nathaniel gorham a son of massachusetts the hotbed of anti-royalism wrote on behalf of the government to prince henry younger brother of the prussian king frederick the great the thirteenth sons of King Hen Wilhelm the Third, Henry, had been made a colonel at the age of fourteen and proved himself to be an extremely talented commander as well as an enlightened leader, like his older brother, an erudite gentleman interested in art and ideas. The Americans had a positive view of Prussia in general, and Henry in particular because of Friedrich von Steuben, a volunteer who fought at Valley Forge and a veteran of the Prince's Own Wars. It was likely von Steuben who recommended the young Hohenzollern royal to Alexander Hamilton. In the letter, now lost, Henry was invited to cross the Atlantic and become the king of the United States of America. He was, he was to have been head of a constitutional monarchy modeled on the very same English system that the colonies had fought a desperate war to overthrow. Von Steuben was skeptical of any chance of acceptance, but duly forwarded the missive to Berlin. In fact, Henry's response, found more than a century later among his papers, proving the fact of what many had assumed was a legend, was indeed to decline. New York Senator Rufus King later reported that the prince had told Steuben that the Americans had shown so much determination against their old king that they would not readily submit to a new one. In short, delegates assembled in Philadelphia to find other means of stability. The result was the U.S. Constitution. Let me tell you what the U.S. Constitution emerged from. And I remember, like, I'm a Bill of Rights person, totally on board. But still, I face truth, or, well, what I believe. I, these are my opinions, but still. The U.S. Constitution was the result of the reality of power. The states realized they needed a federal authority that had power outside of the state, that had a legitimization of power outside of the states, 
that they could use as uh, some impediment to some pre pre violent taking impediment to right maybe righteous violent impediment to people who would rise up against their their insane tax laws and they knew that the reality of power was such was really that i mean it's it's not as true not nearly as true in america today as it was then and 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 it was true in this world certainly way more than in europe it had been in in maybe a thousand years at that point and that is that the land was populated first off densely across mountainous rivered thick forested regions people that were really really self-sustaining that uh if you said well we're gonna cut off your um oh damn can't cut anything off they got like everything like it it was that kind of reality and so the constitution took as much power as they thought they could take and it opened the door for them to take more and that was the constitution the constitution was uh basically walking back <laughs> walking back the freedom of the of of the people by inserting a more powerful federal government but the constitution is created constitutional convention and just uh i just want to highlight just a little bit of some of the things you're talking about here so the way to prevent this is madison the way to prevent a majority from having an interest to oppress the minority is to enlarge the sphere these are madison notes from the convention this is from june 1st 1787 elected monarchies turbulent and unhappy men unwilling to to administer so decided the superiority of merit in an individual as to exceed in his appointment to so preeminent a station if several are admitted as there will be many competitors of equal merit they may all be included, contention prevented, and the Republican Gen something genie consulted. I don't know to, to what that's supposed to be. Okay, so I just uh, elective monarchies turbulent unhappy. Now, why do you think that he was spending any time like making these notes? Like people are literally debating this in the Constitutional Convention. It wasn't really settled what was what what, what really by my take, and I read these notes. And I read interpretations of these notes, and, you know, my memory is not very precise, so uh, take that for what it's worth. But my general sense is what emerged from the Constitutional Convention because of the admixture of uh, folks. These were the, these were the, there was nobody there, maybe with some few exception, I, 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 who, who knows, but nobody there of note, nobody there of any significance that contributed to this that was not one in a position of 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 significant uh geopolitical power these were the owners these were the managers these were the 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 basically the wealthy families of america essentially that sent their representatives to try to negotiate with the poor that's what the constitution is that's the way i view the constitution and what they came up with was the, the, the emergence of the reality of power, which is they understood that at their heart that they had no real power over these people. And uh, they had to be able to have a legitimization of being able to strategically pin prickly apply federal coercive power when needed. And so to that end... Uh, they created this. This was their compromise. And they created it in a way, like lawyers do, with all kinds of uh, giant holes fully intended to be exploited in the court of law as it was quickly done uh, in, in, in no short order. I mean, uh, well, and I won't get into that. A at any rate, so the Constitutional Convention emerges and then we get, you know, it's, it's just not a enough. Now I'm getting this uh, from the ACLU, okay? The ACLU page, which is very ironical right now. A Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth, general or particular, and what no just government should refuse. Thomas Jefferson, 
December 20, 1787. In the summer of 1787, delegates from the 13 states convened in Philadelphia and drafted a remarkable blueprint for self-government, the Constitution of the United States. The first draft set up a system of checks and balances that included a strong executive branch, a representative, legislature, and a federal a judiciary. The Constitution was remarkable but deeply flawed. For one thing, it did not include a specific declaration or bill of individual rights. It specified what the government could do but did not say what it could not do. For another, it did not apply to everyone. The consent of the government meant pro pro property to white men only. True story. Doesn't, doesn't negate the, the, the rest of the Constitution, though, the, the, the parts that are useful. This is the awful that we throw out, this part, the awful. O-F-F-A-L if you don't know the word. So you don't think I'm thinking off, saying awful. The absence of a Bill of Rights turned out to be an obstacle to the Constitution's ratification by the states. It would take four more years of intense debate before the new government's form would be resolved. The Federalists opposed including a Bill of Rights on the grounds that it was unnecessary. The Anti-Federalists, who were afraid of a strong centralized government, refused to support the Constitution without one. In the end, popular sentiment was decisive. Recently freed from the despotic English monarchy, the American people wanted strong guarantees that the new government would not trample upon their newly won freedom of speech, press, and religion, or upon their blah, 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 blah. This is basically, listen, man, we want to be able to uh, to produce the same crap that you produce. This is, now they wouldn't have understood it that way, but this is really. These types of laws, when you can violate speech of uh, certain groups and not others, you are basically significantly, immediately limiting their ability to produce the same level of craft that, that you can. They have to produce these stilted uh, versions of life. It's horrible. Uh... Uh, and when you can control the, the, the religions, the beliefs, then you can control the type of institution structures that emerge from the belief systems that are, by, by coercion, homogenous throughout the land. So the Constitution's framers heeded Thomas Jefferson, who argued a Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth, general or particular, and what no just government should refuse or rest or in or on inference. The American Bill of Rights inspired by Jefferson and drafted by James Madison. <laughs> I don't know if it was inspired by Jefferson. It, it, this was a this was a, a, a cause for James Madison since he was a young man. Like he, he, he was instrumental in, in in writing the Virginia Bill of Rights, which came a couple of years before this. This is weird to say this. Okay, whatever. And in 1791, the Constitution's first 10 amendments became the law of the land. Early American mistrust of government power came from the colonial experience itself. Most historians believe that the pivotal event, well, who cares, whatever, whatever. So, so the Bill of Rights basically emerges because after they write the Constitution, I think people kind of understand, well, that's the, that's the handcuff on us. We need a handcuff on you or otherwise this, this ain't going to float. It's like the anti-federal, I mean, the Federalist arguing rightly, I think, in, in a lot of their cases about why you shouldn't have a Bill of Rights. And basically, the minute that you write something on paper, you immediately create the power for government. They'll find a way to use that as a power creator rather than a power limiter. And in essence, is how the long, longhand way of the way I read it. And I believe that. I believe that's essentially what has happened. But at the same hand, I kind of believe uh, it's also not just been that. It's dialectical in the reality in that it has produced that on one hand. But on the other hand, it has produced in human beings in America, American citizens, uh, and in even possibly even more when American citizens become American citizens when they're not born here, when they when they immigrate here and then they become Americans and the process they got to go through and how proud they are of what they've done and what they know about the Bill of Rights and they're like yeah yeah the Bill of Rights very 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 powerful influencer of human action in the American lands today fundamentally. Uh, what is the Bill of Rights though? Ultimately, what is the Bill of Rights? Is it what Teen Vogue wants you to think Bill of Rights is? The Second Amendment has always been a tool of white supremacy. This was written... This is Teen Vogue, okay? Teen Vogue thinks teen girls need to read an article that tries to fear them into thinking that guns equals racism. When racism is, in, in essence, it's a capital offense. 
Just even suspicious of racism is enough to get you killed in America today in certain parts of the land. And here... Here, this, 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 this is... This is Teen Vogue. This is primarily uh, an audience for girls. So this is a man. Let's see if it's a white man. That would be awesome if it was a white man. Please be a white man. Please be a white man. Please be a white man. Please... Please be perfectly a white man. Where are you? What do you look like? What do you look like? Joshua Manson. All right, let's 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 do it this way then. Let's see what Joshua Manson looks like this way. Don't, don't, don't tease me, bro. Yeah, I went all the way back there. All right. There he is. Look at this. Does he get paid eight? Oh, no, that's ice hockey. Sorry, I don't want to blame you. Okay, I don't want to blame... Oh, gosh. I'm sorry. Oh, no face. No face. Not sure. All right. I don't want to hire you. Okay, anyway, so Josh is uh, is out. I have no idea what, what he is, but I, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be... I'm... I'd be hard-pressed to believe that he wasn't a white dude writing this idiocy. Just total using using race, the fear of of the white uh, devil destroying you, as a method to convince black people and everybody else, I guess, that somehow life would be better if only the government had guns. Somehow, that's that's where these folks are at. What are these folks doing? They are they are using their moral constructs to undermine, like John Ball, except uh, uh, in the exact uh, reverse. They're John Ball in reverse. In this instance, in, in John Ball's instance, what he is saying, he is, he is basically using the morality of Christianity to destroy the morality of the king. What these folks are doing is 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 they're using one part of American morality. We are fundamentally anti racist and anti bigoted. It's in our Bill of Rights. It's 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 why we have been so fundamentally challenged by our inconsistency in living out the Bill of Rights because of the fact that the Bill of Rights is the king of the land. When we undermine people's standing based upon their race, color, gender, sexual orientation, blah, 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 blah. Whatever way we want to intellectually try to justify doing that when we live in a Bill of Rights land, parts of us, our heuristic institutions, fundamentally understand that what we're really doing is, uh, is we're undermining the king. And I'm not sure we want to undermine this king. Because this king isn't Charles I, and this king isn't Oliver Cromwell. This king is the Bill of Rights. It is not a man or a woman. It is not a political party. It is not a, a scientific school of thought. It is a restraint on whatever versions of human governance human beings can come up with. It is a restraint that, that, that allows for we, the poors, the, the the farmers and the farm workers. It allows us a space to actually be able to produce the ha same high level of quality craft that our quote-unquote leaders, our betters can. And this is one of the most certain ways that you can continue to delegitimize the myth of some sort of uh, special ability, uh, special privilege of of a ruling class is to continue to be able to produce quality that is at a level or better than what they can produce and that is constantly what they seek to prevent us from being able to do and uh it is the bill of rights fundamentally the king that allows for us to not have to wrestle with the question in the first place where does the divine right of kings come from? There is no, the, 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 the king, the king is solipsistic. The king's divine right comes from the king's limiting power. 
the king's ideational limiting power on on the on the privileged few in government who have the advantage of coercive assumption over everybody else they are allowed to coerce on others and and you can argue in many ways that kind of understood uh that that we are not and, and for that uh there must be a significant limitation including first and foremost the second amendment should be the first amendment the Second Amendment is the First Amendment. The right to basically defend oneself even against one's own government because our government fundamentally understands, like, like I won't say no other government, but very few governments, and like very few governments of, uh, of any note of the last 2,000 some odd years, this is not a government whose job is to make human beings in its image this government's fundamental authority comes from a king that declares your job is to fundamentally settle disputes and to allow for uh, equal and open access to the ability to pursue lives of one's choosing. That is the role of government. The role of government is not to to force people to be moral, to force people to be Christian, to force people to be atheist, to force people to be Muslim, to force people to be a particular type of Christian, to force people to be a particular type of political ideology. That is not the role of an American government whose, whose king is the Bill of Rights. And this is why you have things like this. They have to do this. They have to de- legitimize the king in order to replace him with with a return with with, with basically with, with a return to this with a return to the to, to the age of the priest kings where it is where it is uh, the the in their case probably the, the 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 demigods the the demigods of the cult of equality and diversity who will now declare the moral certain tarianism but they won't go down the mandate of heaven route because they don't want to face that consequential type of circumstance they they will go to priest king they will go to something more ancient even than than the chinese way they will go back to mesopotamia they will go back to naram sin this is what they hope to unleash upon the land and so long as well, our last refuge that we're now going through in America is to go through the courts. That's more important than this election, by the way. This election doesn't mean anything as far as I see it. Uh, I see the symbolic uh, importance of a Trump landslide victory uh, in terms of beating back this SJW authoritarian garbage. But uh, I don't know necessarily that I see it in and of itself as being anything that'll be of note if the courts fail to do their duty and and the and the judicial branches in general the the da's out there that are not uh, members of antifa while serving in the american government which is seems odd seems weird i don't know weird uh We'll see what happens, but we have to go through that process, and this is where we find out if, if the Bill of Rights is still king. If the Bill of Rights is still king, it doesn't really matter if the Democrats win, even if they overwhelmingly win. If the Bill of Rights is still king, then this means that uh, when, when, when whatever it is that's the final straw, maybe they pass sweeping gun legislation, and... Republican states, conservative states, that's probably when it would begin. Uh, my suspicion is they'll just say, we don't recognize the authority, that, uh, that this is not a legitimate authority, and therefore uh, we uh, we don't recognize. You, you try to send federal authorities here. As a matter of fact, we're sending all federal authorities out. And uh, our, our, we're, we're keeping the federal authorities that uh, stay with the, the American people, the American Bill of Rights and the American state. And parts of the federal government will stay and parts of the federal government won't. And then I think there will be this process and you'll see some skirmishes and all that. And I think in the end what the uh, the DNC is going to find is that its power is really parts of Chicago, New York, uh, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, 
little little or much less significant pockets here and there but but, but fundamentally you're going to find and those pockets will be surrounded and engulfed and then after that uh then uh we'll have to have a new election in which we have americans running that is people who pledge to actually uphold the constitution of the united states most importantly the bill of rights because it is the bill of rights that is the key the cornerstone really if you took away the whole constitution and you just kept the bill of rights in place i'm good i'm willing to negotiate as long as we have the bill of rights i'm good and as long as we have the bill of rights fundamentally in the in the and this is where privilege is nice this is where you want privilege i want americans to have a sense of american privilege to actually think that they're entitled to these bills of rights and to act like it even if i don't like you like anybody protesting out there that's saying horrible things if all you're doing is protesting i ain't care if you're busting crap up now i care now you're violating our contract this is going beyond now you're violating the bills of rights of others that ain't right sorry you don't get to you don't get to use violence as a means of political negotiation where the bill of rights is king might does not make right in the land where the bill of rights is king i'm sorry this has to end and cannot continue to negotiate with terrorists at this point so i guess i'm going to end it here uh, I hope that I've uh, convinced you all now that, uh, at the very least, don't vote. It's much more important for you to challenge the people locally. Your local governments are doing crazy stuff now. Your local school boards. Look in your schools. That's where it's really happening. All kinds of lawsuits that have to happen. That's where this real. That's where the real fight is. It's not about the elected officials. This is not a government that should depend upon elections for its liberty. If it's a government that depends upon its elections for its liberty, that's already a problem. Now the courts have to, we have to find out if the courts are with us or against us. And you have to go through that process and exhaust it. And once you find out that the courts are fundamentally against you, if you find that out, well then, then that's a whole other world altogether. I have no idea what happens after that, but I don't think it'll happen. I think that in the end, the courts will mostly come true, mostly come through. And, and, and I guess we'll find out. At any rate, I'm going to end this with, uh, uh, with this.